All right, this is the first project in our uh, digital photography and Photoshop unit. Um, this is kind of meant to acquaint you with your digital camera. Um, I highly recommend that you bring your own digital camera. Uh, the reason for this is, you know, we, we don't have a whole lot of digital cameras at the high school. I think we have like three or four. Um, so there's not enough to supply the whole class with some. And chances are you'll probably bring one in that's a bit nicer than ours. Uh, or you could potentially borrow one from a friend or family member that would be nicer than ours. So this is preferable for many reasons. Uh, you'll get acquainted with something you'll be able to use later in life and you'll probably uh, protect it a little bit better than, it, than uh, you would with our equipment. Uh, we can store your camera if you want in one of our locked closets. Uh, nobody really messes with those closets and uh, you can keep it there over the course of the day and take it home every day or you can keep it there overnight if you need to. Uh, we'll be using these cameras for the rest of this unit to take photos um, so make sure you bring them every day or at least remember where they're at or keep them here. Um, back to the project now. Uh, for this project you're going to take uh, about 24 or 25 photos and each of those photos is going to be a pair of photos where you will bracket and demonstrate a technique. Um, bracketing just refers to the fact that you will uh, change the settings to demonstrate how the settings will affect the kind of photo you're taking. Um, and it's a technique that's more often than not used for wet photography where you don't quite know uh, what the best settings are for your photo because you don't have a preview section of your camera like a digital camera so you have to kind of take a couple of photos of the same scene with different settings to see which one's the best. Uh, this is kind of the same thing except this is just going to acquaint you with um, how to uh, change the settings of your camera and, and kind of what that does to each photo. Um, the first uh, setting you're going to use is the ISO setting and ISO just has to do with how sensitive your camera is to light. Uh, the higher the ISO the more sensitive it is and the more light it lets in. The lower the ISO the less light it lets in and the less sensitive it is. Um, it came from uh, wet photographies and it, uh, film. Uh, film had different ISOs to it. You could buy like 100 ISO film and that was great for shooting outside uh, in full daylight and then uh, you could buy like higher ISO film like 200 for shooting at night time so that you could pick up more light. Here's a, an, an example of uh, the difference in ISO. Uh, the one on the left is set at 100. Lower ISOs usually get better detail, much finer detail, especially if there's enough light in the shot um, to kind of you know have your settings be normal for all the other settings. The one on the right is same daylight situation but uh, with a much higher ISO and you'll notice it's it's much grainier. The higher the ISO the grainier the image. Here are some examples of uh, some shots I bracketed to demonstrate ISO. The one on the left has a very low ISO and the one on the right is a very high ISO. You only have to take two shots with two different settings to demonstrate each setting. And uh, you are only changing that setting to demonstrate it. Do not change other settings. So I didn't change my um, shutter speed. I didn't change my exposure. I just changed my ISO to show how ISO affects this same scene. And uh, you'll notice they're not very good photos. Uh, they don't have to be for this project. You're just sort of exploring what happens when you adjust settings on your camera. Um, normally when you bracket shots you take about four or five and then somewhere in the middle would be the sweet spot where the best settings were. Um, for this it doesn't really matter. I don't care if you show me two extremes or if you show me kind of a, a really nice one and a really really bad one. Just so long as you're playing with the settings and you're showing me examples that uh, have different settings on each. Um, to find the ISO on your camera, it's, it's not very hard. Uh, it's always indicated by the acronym ISO. So uh, if you're having trouble finding it in your digital camera settings, uh, let me know and I can help you with that. Here's another example of ISO grain. Um, most often it, than not, it's used as an artistic effect. So, you know, if you're trying to shoot a really moody, kind of grainy, gnarly photo, turn your ISO way up just to kind of add that level of grit and grain to it. The next thing you'll adjust is your uh, shutter speed. Um, shutter speed is uh, just determines how fast 
the shutter opens and closes to let light in. So the longer it stays open, the more light comes in. Uh, if you see the waterfall on the right there, um, you can actually do this technique when you're bracketing your photos. Uh, just, you know, use a water fountain. Um, you'll see the, the waterfall on the left is shot with one two hundredth of a second uh, shutter speed. And then that kind of, what that does is that freezes the water in midair. So it looks like it's glass or frozen. Um, and then on the right, they used a, a third of a second, which is pretty slow, to kind of blur the water. Um, that, that's what happens with shutter speed. You can either freeze time or kind of blur your subject. Um, and it works best with subjects that are stationary while, while shooting and you're shooting a moving object, uh, kind of like the waterfall. You can also control how much light comes in, uh, like the example on the bottom. Shutter speed's uh, often easy to find on your camera. It's usually indicated by a fraction. Um, there's also shutter priority modes on some advanced cameras, so look for the letter S. Um, sometimes there's other acronyms or symbols for shutter speed priority mode, but uh, if you're having trouble finding that mode and you know you have an advanced camera, I can help you find it and play with it. In a shutter speed priority mode, uh, the shutter speed changes depending on what you want it to be, and all of the other settings are automatic. Uh, a couple of these settings here I'll talk about will have priority modes for them, and they're for these kind of creative uh, shooting uh, instances. Here are my bracketed shots in the upper left hand corner. Uh, the shutter speed is so low I can't get enough light of the scene into the camera. And then the one in the upper right, of course, is perfect. But uh, as you can see in the lower left, um, I wasn't even able to hold my camera still enough. Um, that was set at one and a half seconds or one and three, three tenths of a second. And uh, it, it's, it's going to kind of blur the light if you don't hold the camera absolutely still. You can do this if you want. Uh, delayed exposures or delayed shutter speeds uh, allow you to kind of paint with light. Um, if you go into a dark room and take a flashlight and, and set your camera at like five seconds or something, you can, you can draw your name out or paint something with the, with the flashlight, and that can be a lot of fun. The next setting uh, you'll change is the aperture. The aperture is the opening through which the light is coming into the camera's sensors. Uh, it affects how much light is let in, and then it also affects uh, the depth of field. So uh, aperture is indicated by an f-stop. Um, the one on the upper left here, f2, is the most open. And then it ranges from about 1 to 2 to uh, 22 or 30 sometimes. Um, and usually you find it on your camera as like the letter F and then a number. And uh, you can also use your aperture priority mode to adjust aperture only and keep all your other settings automatic. Some cameras do have that. Here we have uh, my first bracketed shot. It's a, it's a low aperture. And what that does to a photo is it, it keeps most things in the front in focus. And then in the background, notice it's very blurred. Um, this is the effect of a wide open aperture. Uh, your, your background always blurs with the wide open aperture and sometimes this can be used to artistic ends so if you want to intentionally blur your background you use a very low aperture setting. Here's my next shot that I bracketed notice it's a high aperture and everything's in focus and that's a very small opening so if you want everything in your photo to be focused uh, use a high aperture setting. Uh, here's some more um, Examples of how aperture affects uh, depth of field. If you can't find this setting on your camera, by the way, uh, just let me know. You can you can steal another camera and just sort of play around with it, or I'll ask you to use some other technique to achieve this. Some more examples of aperture affecting depth of field. Um, the next thing you'll use is the exposure compensation. This kind of adds or divides f-stops to obtain a, a very precise exposure. So it's kind of used as a last resort to sort of adjust a photo and make it just right. Um, to find exposure compensation on your camera, most often it's indicated by a plus and minus symbol 
or this little uh, number line here from minus 2 to plus 2. Um, some cameras have a wider range, but more often than not it's minus 2 to plus 2, and you can adjust that depending on how much uh, compensation you need. When you bracket your shots for your exposure compensation shots, uh, you're going to notice very subtle differences. So you might want to shoot in both extremes to really see the difference. All right, the next technique you're going to use is autofocus. Autofocus is pretty straightforward. Just uh, depress your shutter button and it will automatically focus on your subject for you. Um, one thing I do want you to try is uh, locking your, your exposure, which is a really useful technique. Uh, most autofocus, uh, it can change. You know, you can weight it at a right or center. Uh, some autofocus uh, functions and feature a uh, auto detect feature for faces. Um, when you use autofocus, though, uh, I, I want you to try locking your exposure. To lock your exposure, just to press your shutter button halfway to focus in on a subject, and then you can move your camera around and reframe your shot. Um, the photo on the upper right hand corner shows you how they focused on the leaves and then swung their camera out to kind of get more of the tree in focus. And then the one on the left is what I would not want to see from you uh, when you take your two autofocus shots. Uh, try to focus in on the actual subject, lock your exposure, and then reframe your shot. Manual focus is the opposite of autofocus. You use your lens or some kind of little command path in the camera to uh, manually focus your scene. For some cameras that don't have adjustable lenses, you will have to use like buttons in your uh, preview window on your digital camera to manually focus something. These are a couple of examples of what that would look like. I know my camera uses this uh, technique. On SLR cameras though, you can switch the lens to uh, manual focus using a little button and then you can actually rotate the lens to manually focus on subjects. Uh, manual focus has many advantages over autofocus. It allows you to control the artistic uh, intent of the photograph um, and it's really useful for action shots and panning. Uh, macro focus allows you to focus on small subjects um, at incredibly close distances. Like when you want to shoot something that's really, really tiny and you want to get really, really close to it, you use a macro fo focus setting. Uh, the macro focus setting is always, almost always indicated by a tulip shape. So look for that on your camera to change it to macro. Um, and then SLR cameras, you can actually get or buy like a, a macro lens. And uh, when you shoot macro shots, you want to find a subject that has a lot of detail or is very tiny, and you want to get really, really close to it, kind of like the photo of the big camera in the lower right-hand corner. Um, here's some examples of my bracketed shots for macro focus. On the left-hand side, I use autofocus, and I got really, really close to that rose, and I wasn't quite able to make it work. Um, and once I turned on my macro uh, focus setting, uh, I was able to get real close to the flower and keep it in focus. Um, on the bottom are some other examples of what you can do with macro focus. Uh, play around with it, it's a really cool tool. Front focus does not refer to an actual setting on your camera. It refers to a technique. Um, any front focus shot is a shot where the subject is in the foreground and it is in focus. Uh, hence the name front focus, and the background is uh, blurry. So here's some examples of front focus shots. Um, notice the subject in the foreground is in focus and then the background is very blurry. This is how you want to shoot your front focus shots. Uh, just shoot two different scenes with um, different subjects and, and demonstrate this technique using uh, your aperture or macro setting or your manual focus. doesn't matter which technique you use. Bokeh refers to the shape of light when it's out of focus. Um, that shape is actually determined by your aperture, but um, bokeh is considered uh, artistically desirable when shooting um, lights at night. Here's some examples of uh, the bokeh effect. Notice, uh, you know, the subjects are usually in focus, and then as you go further into the background, all those tiny little lights turn into circles 
And this is just a desirable, pretty looking effect that you can do with your camera. Um, if you're having trouble shooting like a, an actual city scene, don't worry. We have uh, some Christmas lights you can use and to achieve this effect. You can also change the shape of your bokeh depending on the shape of your uh, aperture. So if you take like a little sheet of paper and cut a weird shape hole in it, you can uh, change the shape of the bokeh. Here's another setup for changing your aperture shape. Uh, white balance is kind of the last thing you'll mess with. Um, white balance has to do with the temperature of the white. Uh, white can either be cool and kind of grayish and blue, or sometimes white looks really warm and kind of orange in a scene. When you use uh, your white balance setting on your camera, you want to use first the manual white balance setting. So in the upper left hand corner, I sampled with my manual white balance uh, this cream colored tabletop and then I, I took a, a photo and what happened was is because the camera thought that cream colored table was true white my whole photo kinda had this weird blue cast to it okay so you can actually use um, that to kinda override what your camera thinks is white um, in the lower left hand side I used uh, the tile floor to set true white and then I took another photo and as you can see that one looks a little bit more normal but again if you're having trouble when you're shooting and you notice your photos kind of discolored or off balance it's probably because your white balance is off and the scene you're shooting in has a, a different sense of color temperature to it so manually set your white balance to whatever prevalent white there is and you might be able to fix some of your photos Your camera also has other automatic white balance settings. Uh, sometimes those settings are, are called like sports or indoors or nighttime. And then sometimes they're in the white balance menu and they are specific to certain kinds of light like tungsten or uh, fluorescent. So on the left you can see the menus uh, where I'm changing the white balance or using some of the preset settings. Um, if you're having trouble finding those settings on your camera, let me know and I'll help you find them. Or you can look at your camera's manual. And then in the lower right hand corner you can see how a scene is bracketed with those settings. So that's an outdoor scene. In the upper left hand side that's the normal automatic setting. And then they change the white balance to probably indoors or nighttime to kind of really mess with the color temperature of each of those photos. Your camera probably has somewhere on it a black and white or sepia setting. Uh, take a couple shots in black and white. It's kind of fun to shoot in black and white. Um, you can create a lot of drama with it and it's just sort of sort of unusual. Uh, if you haven't done it before it's, it's kind of fun. Try it. Uh, if you're having again trouble finding your black and white settings on your camera they're probably in some menu somewhere. Uh, just call me over and we'll play around with it and try to find them. You can also use sepia if you want. It doesn't really matter which color mode you use. I don't care if you use black or white or sepia. Uh, if you have an SLR camera, you have the option to shoot in RAW. RAW files collect all of the light information for a photo. So uh, they kind of take uh, all the different exposure comps. They take all the different, uh, you know, uh, not exactly shutter speed, but uh, a bunch of other things and they just compress it into one file and then when you bring it onto your computer you can adjust all those settings like you would on your camera and, and tweak your photo to make it absolutely perfect. Uh, here's some examples. Um, the lady in the upper right hand corner uh, that is the raw dialog. When you open up a file that's a raw file in Photoshop you'll be prompted to change and adjust the settings. Uh, as you can see, the, the woman on the bottom has her settings adjusted, and that's a phenomenal looking photo. Uh, RAW is also used to achieve uh, high dynamic range photos. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful tool, so if you have an SLR and you don't know how to shoot in RAW, uh, talk to me and I'll show you how to use it. It's a really cool technique. Again, the camera raw dialog box. You can see all the adjustments you can make to a camera raw file. Uh, each camera makes a specific raw file for itself. So if you're having trouble reading that in Photoshop, I'll help you upload codecs, or you can upload it to my computer, which has the ability to update and uh, correct those little discrepancies. 
here are all the uh, techniques you need to show. Again, you need to show at least two bracketed shots for the settings, and then when there's not a setting required like front focus, you just need at least two shots um, for a total of 24 shots. Uh, when you're all done, uh, kind of collect all of those uh, photographs into a PowerPoint and hand in the PowerPoint. Um, I don't necessarily care if you give me the PowerPoint or if you give me the actual photo files. The problem with that is the photo files are rather large files usually and uh, it can be kind of hard to get those to upload and download quickly. So you might want to shrink them in Photoshop. Uh, I can show you how to do that. Or you can just, again, do the PowerPoint, which saves a lot of time.